So hi, my name is Adela Weiss, and I am here to present my work on the Lebeck and Forg no Bison. I am currently a master's student at the Technik University of Munich, but I did most of this project while I was still a student at the Polytechnic University of Bucharest. And I also participated with this project in Symmetry Autumn of Code 2020. As most of you might know, GNU Bison is a parser generator. But let's first make sure that we all agree what a parser is. A parser is a tool. It analyzes a symbol set based on some grammar rules. And it is used in all sorts of contexts. Compilers, interpreters, command line tools, and nowadays in domain-specific languages, especially in behavior-driven development. Now, Bison was used in all of these examples, so GCC, Bash, Shell, CMake. Some of this project decided to move on from it, but it's important to note that they decided to move on to a handwritten parser for their problem, so they didn't move away to another general-purpose solution. Now, about Bison itself. Bison, as I said, is a general-purpose parser generator. Through abuse of terminology, most people refer to it as just a parser, but it is somewhat incorrect because it needs a grammar to generate the parsing rules. Bison is also the de facto LR parser generator, LR standing for left to right, right most derivation. Bison implements two such algorithms. The first one is deterministic, and it's called LALR1. So it needs one token look ahead in order to figure out the rule it parses. The other one is non-deterministic, and it's called GLR, or generalized LR. Bison supports, chronologically, the languages C, C++, Java, and the last edition, D. The D language backend is available since last September and since version 3.8. Right now, the D language only supports the LLR1 algorithm. The GLR will come in time. Um, as you might know if you're familiar with this conference, I'm not the first person to come here and present a parsing solution for the D language. So let's see what's the state of the parser generators in this ecosystem. For Antler, the latest version, Antler 4, supports the language, but in an unofficial fork. And the reason for this is because the tests are written separately and are not introduced in Antler's test suite. The previous version, Antler 3, had active support for the D language, but it's not supported anymore. There are all sorts of uh, parser generators across time, but most of them lost support. And in the case of LL Tool, which was also presented at this conference, the problem is that there is a single point of failure. It's maintained by only one person, so any addition depends on this person's time. So, I identify this need of having an established official parser with active support. And, of course, it's nothing bad in adding more variety for parsers. Outside of Goldie, all of these parsers implement LL algorithms, so left to right, leftmost derivation. And if we also want to think from the point of view of attracting new D users, it is easier to convince someone to try one new technology rather than two. It's easier to convince them to try D when they can still use the parser of their choice. Now, you might notice that I didn't say anything about what is probably the most popular parser generator in the D language, PEGD. So, let's see in the case of PEGD. PEGD stands for Parsing Expression Grammar. And this uh, parsing solution is written only for the D language. So let's compare PEGD and Bison. Both PEGD and Bison use memoization. And in the case of PEGD, it's proportional with the input size. For Bison, it only needs the depth of the parsing tree. So PEGD is more likely to crash with an out-of-memory error, especially for very big inputs. But from the time complexity point of view, PEGD is faster when it deals with ambiguous grammars. It parses the grammar in linear time, while Bison, in worst case, will parse it in a bigger notation of polynomial of degree three. So in this case, PEGD is faster. Also, PEGD doesn't need a lexer. Bison doesn't have an associated lexer, so you as the user are supposed to introduce it in the program. So from the point of view of the development, PEGD might be faster. But let's look what happens when we are parsing uh, 
an, an arithmetic calculator grammar with both pegged and bison. So in this case, I am doing the following calculation, one plus one divided by one minus zero, and I choose to parse this one million times. The reason why I chose this size of the input is because Bison was so fast that up until this input size, I couldn't actually measure anything consistently. So, it's a simple enough grammar that Bison can parse it with LLR1. Bison will parse it in five seconds and pegged in six minutes. And it gets worse because for Bison, this is the real time. For pegged, it's just an estimation. Because of this input size, it crashes with an out of memory error. At the end of the day, you're choosing the parser that suits your project, but for big inputs, and especially for grammars that can be parsed with LLR1, I recommend to use Bison. I mentioned before uh, that Bison can be used in behavior-driven development with domain-specific languages. So let's take an example. A customer comes to you and says that I want a program that authentifies the user and then allows the user to make all sorts of operations with file in Google Drive. But here's the catch. The customer doesn't speak English very well. They might speak, so in this case, the customer is Romanian, so they would want a grammar that works in Romanian. And the second thing is that they're not programmers. So you also need to create a very simple language for them so they, would, so they would not have to know anything about programming beforehand. So in this case, you can create a grammar that looks like this. It has very simple operations, login, create, write in, and then the parameters for those operations. Now, we are going to look at what Bison does with this so-called tokens. The token kind is the visible token that is actually visible in your input. In this case, these are our keywords, login, logout, create, and so on. In the case of EOL, it stands for end of line, and it's uh, a Bison internal, so you don't actually need to specify it. Then we have the last token, which is the parameter. So in our earlier case, those parameters are basically everything that is not a keyword. So the user, the password, the file, the input, all of these are parameters. Now let's look how Bison creates the output. The code comes from three main sources. The first one is the user input. You are supposed to specify the grammar, the lexer, as I said before, and then other user code, which is basically the business logic of your project. Then Bison source will take the information from the grammar and lexer We'll interpret the grammar rules and we'll transform the lexers with some internal token data. Then all of this will be put together by the language backend. This one is language specific, so the D language backend is written in D, and it also implements the parsing algorithm. Right now, only LLR1 is available for the D language. So all of these things are put together, and the output is source code in your target language, in this case, D. You can compile and run this code however you want, there is no restriction. But let's see what would be the difference if the GLR would exist. So you are writing a program and at some point you add a new rule in the grammar and you realize that you can't use the LLR1 anymore and you would want to switch to a GLR. But what exactly in all of the input file you should change? Well you should just add this line. That's all you need to do. All the other program parts should remain the same. So let's talk about the Lexers API first. As I said, Bison doesn't have a Lexer associated with it. So you as the user are supposed to implement this Lexer or you can use a Lexer generator. You should provide information about three entities. The token kind that we just saw before, the semantic value and the location. In this case, there are two types of tokens. There are tokens with invariant values, for example, this one, that will always have the value login, or you can have tokens that have variant values. So in this case, the parameter can be anything. So in this case, the semantic value should contain that variant value. 
Now, in the other backends, what happens is that the return value of the lexer is the token kind. The semantic value and the location are returned in different ways. They are either variables or class attributes. The reason why this happens is historical. So Bison wanted to be backward compatible with its first version, Yak, but it was written in a language called B, which didn't provide any sort of encapsulation. For, for D language, we decided that we don't want to be backward compatible with the language B, so we are not doing this at all. Instead, we are returning a complete symbol that holds together all of these values. But now, this uh, way of returning things can have some problems. Behind the scenes, the deep backend will create symbol constructors for all of the data types that a semantic value can take. Our example only has uh, a semantic value of type string, but there could be parsers that also need ints or a custom class. So what happens is that at compile time, the following instructions would be accepted. So I have a token kind of type int, and the semantic value is an int. Everything is great. A token kind of type string, and I'm returning a string. Again, this is fine. But this would also be fine. There is no correlation between the token kind and the semantic value at this stage. So in order to have compile time errors, you can use this directive called API token constructor, which basically, instead of calling the constructor directly, it will call a method with the same name of the token, and that method will await for the correct semantic value. So for our example, in the case of the token that has an invariant value like login, you are supposed to just return the location, but in the case of the symbol that has a variant value, you are supposed to return that value and then the location. And now you will have compile time errors if uh, they are not correlated. Another thing I introduced in the D language backend were the custom error messages. When I inherited the project, there were already workflows for the simple error messages. And in this case, it will output the location and just syntax error. Again, it's there for backward compatibility reasons. I don't see why in 2022 you would want to use this. For the detailed ones, Bison's backend will create an error string that contains the token that created the error and the expected tokens. We basically want the user, in the case of the customer messages, to have access to an API of this context. So we want the user to be able to know the location in which an error occurred, the token that created it, and the expected tokens in that case. So I had to create this class that will now be available to the user and provides this API for the custom error messages. Another uh, feature of the D backend is the error recovery uh, counter reset. What happens when Bison encounters an error is that it outputs the error message, but most probably the next tokens will also produce error, and most probably it will be because of this earlier error. In order to not pollute the error log with all of these messages, Bison will skip outputting error messages for the next three tokens. But sometimes we don't want this to happen. In this case, we have our earlier grammar with two of the rules for login and logout, and we also have part of the Bison grammar that we wrote in our program. So in this case, the instruction delimiter is the end of line. So we would have the following input. We want to log in a user, but we forgot to give the password. So we have login, user, and then new line. Bison will notice that it's an error, and it will give us the location, the unexpected token, end of line, and instead of it, it was expecting a parameter. But for the next line, we get nothing, even though it's clearly another error. Again, we forget to give the parameter. The reason why this happened is the one from uh, before, as in the token that created the error is the new line, and then we start counting. The first token is a keyword, it's correct. Then the second token creates the, er the error, but we still didn't 
await three tokens up until the moment uh, we got the earlier error. So, because of this, there will be no error outputted by Bison. So in these particular cases, we know that after an instruction is done, the next, we want to know if an error exists on the next instruction. So what we do is just call this method. And now the error recovery counter will be reset, and we will have an error on the next line too. Another feature of Bison is that it supports both pull and push parsers, and I implemented the push parsers. In both cases, we have three entities. So the user code, the parser, and the lexer. In the case of a pull parser, the user code will call the parser once, and then the parser will repeatedly call the lexer in order to find the tokens. The parser will then return to the user just an accept or abort at the end of the input, accept if everything went well, or abort if it encountered at least one error. Now, of course, this is fast, and you would want to use it especially in command line tools. In the case of a push parsers, we have again the user code, the lexer, and the parser. But in this case, the user will call the lexer, and then we'll send this value to the parser. So the user now is the one that makes the repeated calls. Now the parser will also return accept and abort, like before, at the end of the input. But if the input is not fully processed, it will also return push more so that uh, the user would know that it should call the Elixir again for other tokens. This offers, of course, more granular control over the parsing process. So especially in graphical interface programs, you would want to use this type of parsers. Another thing I added was the internationalization. So this basically means that we wanted to have translated error messages. Behind the scenes, I am using gettext, which is also used by CNC++. In this case, I chose to do this, one, because the D language doesn't have a specific way of providing internationalization, and two, because by using gettext, I had access to the already existing catalogs of translations that were available in Bison. And, of course, I use this by using the extern C directive. As I said before, it's your choice as the user how you would want to compile the code that Bison creates for you. In the case that you would want to use dub, and you would also want to translate your own error messages, you might want to also use gettext, because it's already used by Bison. But I found that it was kind of difficult to import it in your project, and also the, and I also find it hard to work with the catalogs. So what I did, I created a D library, which you can use with dub to import get text in your project, and it also has example on how to use the translation catalogs. I actually have a demo with the earlier example of the Google Drive uh, interactions. And the Google Drive code is made by my colleague, Robert Taron, also participated with his project in Symmetry Autumn of Code 2020. So, Bison has four parts. The first one is called the prologue, and it's supposed to have all sorts of imports, defines, global variables, I always ignore it in the case of the D language. The second part is the Bison declarations. Basically what happens here is that I'm choosing the language, in this case the D language. The next directive is API parser class, which lets me rename the parser. By default it's called YY parser, but sometimes it makes more sense to actually name it for what it does. Then I am choosing the error messages that I want. In this case, I want the backend to deal with them, but I also want to know what exactly is the token that created it and also uh, the expected token. So I'm choosing the detailed uh, error messages. I want to use a push parser. I want to have uh, the compile time errors when I'm 
uh, dealing with the complete symbols. And uh, another thing that I didn't mention before is that uh, all of the tokens that have variant values are going to be held together by a union. It's Again, your choice if you want to write it yourself or you want to let the backend write it for you. If you want to write the backend to write it for you, you should use this directive. And of course, we also want to use locations because we want to know where the error actually uh, is created. We already saw the token constructors, so it's the same grammar, the first part having the invariant tokens, and the second part having the variant tokens with the data type it creates. And then we have the grammar itself. So we read basically line by line. We accept both valid instructions and errors, and also empty lines. In the case of the expressions, the grammar kind of looks like this, of so the name of the token, and then between these brackets, valid decode. So in my case, login file, logout file, all of these are helper functions that are part of my business logic. Now, um, in order to have access to the actual values of the parameters, you should use this syntax. Of course, it's is basically counting the, uh, the token in, inside a rule. This can be easy if you have a small grammar like this, but it can get complicated, especially when you have a lot of tokens inside a single rule. So what you can do is you can actually name these parameters. So the first one would be the user. The second one would be the password. And now you can use this name inside the rules. And it will also help when you are developing the project because maybe you would want to have uh, a lot of changes while you're writing your grammar. And you wouldn't stay to count each and every uh, token each time you change a little thing in your grammar. Then the last part is basically the user code. And we are going to focus on the lexer. Which is called yylex in this case and returns our complete symbol. Of course, the parsing, you just do it through this so you can skip initial, space, initial white spaces and so on. What is of interest for us is the return value. So in this case, we check for each keyword. And as we saw before, we return the method with the same name as the keyword. And at the very end, I decided that everything that is not a keyword, in my case, is a parameter. And I'm providing it the value and the location. And let's also look at how our main looks like. So the first two lines are just business logic. Then in, when I have to uh, call the parser, I provide to it the token that is parsed through the lexer. And then if the status is still push more, if the parser still asks for other tokens, I just repeat this process. In our case, we have the following inputs. So we want to log in a user with a very strong password. We want to create a test to write in it, and then delete the file and disconnect the user. So I also have this uh, script. Basically, the uh, way to call Bison is just this, Bison in the file. And then I decided to run my project through Dub. So in this case, and we can actually check that 
this operation actually happen. So I was logged in, I created the file. The file uh, has now a new content. It was overridden, it has a new content. I appended. And now the file was deleted and I was logged out. So from the point of view of the customer that wants to test your program, they basically just have to write this, which makes sense for them. And behind the scenes, all the program is going to be tested. And for the user, it's very easy to check that this uh, operations actually happened. As a bit of history, uh, for the D backend, it all started when Oliver Mangel decided to port the Java skeleton to the D language. And later, HSTO made improvements, especially regarding using D language features. This was called the experimental backend, which was part of the Bison backend for a while, but it wasn't officially supported. This is what I inherited, and I added a lot of user customization, I tested it, and I also added documentation in Bison's manual. So after all of these steps were taken, now the LLR1 is officially supported. As challenges for me, um, when I started the project, I had a total coding experience in D of 10 minutes. I knew what Bison was, and I've never heard of GNU M4 or Autotest. So, <laughs> so I had to basically learn all of these things. So I had a ramp up period during the summer. And M4 is its own thing. I think I said, <laughs> I think I said earlier that the language backend is written in the target language. It's not, it's written in M4. It all looks like this. So M4 is a macro language. From its point of view, it, it's language agnostic. So it just receives strings, it outputs strings. That those strings in some particular cases happen to be decode, it's, a totally, uh, it's totally irrelevant for M4. Now. You might uh, not believe me that this is decode, but you have a static auto there. <laughs> you have a type of. And you have some uh, return symbol. That's kind of everything that is pure decode that is going on in there. Everything else is uh, provided by Bison's backend. But yeah, it, especially if you have nested ifs, it, it gets funny writing. M4. The most challenging task for me was, funnily enough, the internationalization, so it didn't have actually anything to do with parsing, and especially because of the language catalogs. And I also misjudged the number of missing features for the deep backend, because when I first proposed the project in Symmetry Atom of Code, I said that I was going to write the GLR, but after I realized that there are so many missing features, I decided to first finish those and have a completely functional LLR1 and then go on uh, to writing the GLR. As mentors, I worked a lot with Akim Demey, who is a Bison commentator, but I also had a lot of help from Edward Stanilo, Jurgas Van Nitsu, and AHS Kioch. And of course, from the D community. And I really enjoyed those interactions on the forum. As contributions, uh, I sent patches to Bison's mailing list because Bison uses its own Git called GNU Savannah, but I use GitHub for reviews or as a way to structure my own work. As I said, I participated with this project in Symmetry Atom of Code 2020, and for me it was a very positive experience, and I especially like that outside of the weekly and monthly updates, I could manage my own time. I actually participated to it alongside full-time studies. I was in my fourth year of bachelor's, 
And I think I grew a lot during this project because before I had no experience in writing APIs, I also learned how to use D. And I, during this project, I used a lot of compile time features and garbage collector. And while I was working on Bison, I realized that some things can be improved. So I made PRs to both DMD and Phobos in order to do that. Of course, I also learned more about LR parsing, and I enjoyed interacting with all of you. As conclusions, um, the D language backend is now fully supported since version 3.8 for the LLR1 algorithm. And it implements all the customization features of the other parsers. And I also want to continue the work on the GLR. And I might have some news about that real soon, like midnight soon, unless the, my university doesn't want another extension like last semester. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I'll keep you updated. And that is all for me. All right, question time. And we got one right here already. So um, conceptually, how big of a limitation um, is uh, L LALR1 versus GLR? Like, uh, say, could you parse Lua with uh, an LAR? LR? Uh, I'm not sure what kind of grammar Lua has. I'm going to say no. Yeah, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm curious, because like, um, I, I have a possible use for this, and this is exciting. <laughs> yeah, basically it all uh, stands if, if you need only one to token look ahead, then everything is fine. Depends on your grammar. All right, anybody that's not Manu? <laughs> <laughs> um, on, on that same topic, I've actually, when I start writing grammars, there's a whole bunch of rules you have to actually keep to to make LR one work correctly. And it requires, at least in my experience, I had to read quite a bit just to understand those rules. But that's kind of when I started discovering pegged because the flexibility of the parsing expression grammar was pretty high. And just instead of banging my head against the table, I just I, I, knew I wanted to use a more flexible parser. It's tricky, though. You have to understand, like, there's how you place rules, how you recurse, how rules can refer to each other, that's where most of the limitations come from when you're using LAR1, at least in my experience, but you probably know much better than me. Sure. Thank you, and, and I think I have the answer to the question, but I would like to go to, back to slide 21, please. Sure. Because um, these parser generators can be a little complicated with their when do they do what. So here we mentioned Bison gives errors or doesn't give errors, but I think we mean the code generated by Bison gives or doesn't uh, um, either prints the yes. error or skips them, right? Yes. yes. So I was a little confused, but just uh, yeah, I think yeah, it's sure. worth to make that level. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. I have a question. Um, so you said the advantage of Bison was that it can handle very complex expressions, but the example you showed seemed very simple, like something you could almost do with just a string split on spaces. So I wondered if that was just a like, experiment, or is, does, there, does Bison actually have advantages even in those cases? Uh. Like, I wanted to have a simple demo for this presentation, but of course that you can do more complicated things. For example, uh, Bison was used in the first C compiler, so you can parse entire languages with it. Okay. All right, Who, who's got more questions? More questions, come on. Yeah, Ali has questions, I like Ali. So uh, we like pegged, and we know it's being used um, in um, the industry. Why is it so slow? Can we make it faster as well? Is it worth it? Um, I'm not sure about pegged internals, but I'm assuming that um, because the Elixir is integrated in pegged, maybe there 
maybe in the case of my program, I, I handwritten my lecture. So it, from, even from that point, it should be way faster. So I'm assuming it's a combination of both the algorithms themselves, but also the lexer. Any, any more questions? Or are you all just hanging out for a break? I need a break. Everybody else need a break? Yep. All right, cool. Then thank you, Adela.